The Household of Faith would like to invite you to worship with us. Worship services are held at the Indiana University Northwest Library Conference Center, room LC110. For more information, please visit www.israelteach.com. This lesson is about what you must do in order to ensure your entrance into God's kingdom. And we're going to see that the Lord tells us that we are to be holy and perfect. And by saying that we are to be holy, God is telling us that we are to be as he is. The God that we serve is a pure and righteous God. David says in Psalms, speaking of the Lord, that he is righteous in all his ways. God is righteous in all that he is and all that he does. And as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, we are required to be as he is. As his servants, we are to be righteous when it comes to our character and our behavior. And it is that righteousness that makes you whole. And we're going to see what constitutes you being righteous is when your treatment of others and your service and worship of God is according to God's command. Your obedience is what makes you righteous, and it is your obedience to God's commandment that makes you holy. And what brings, and that brings us to what it means to be perfect. Because to be truly righteous and holy requires a certain mindset, a mindset that has been nurtured and developed, one that enables you to live your life according to the complete will of God. And when you obtain the mindset that allows you to do all according to God's will, then you are perfect. And that's what this journey is about when it comes to serving the Lord. And that is learning how to live a life according to God's will so that in the end you can become God. We're going to see that in the course of this lesson, God requires us to be holy and perfect. And what constitutes you being holy is your obedience to God's commandments. And we're going to see that being perfect is the completion of your growth as a servant of the Lord. It is a crime of a mindset that allows you to live a godly life, to live according to the complete will of God. We're going to start this lesson off in Romans, the first chapter. And again, the title is, You Must Strive to Be Holy and Perfect to Ensure That You Obtain Perfection. And we want to see what the perfection is that we ultimately are seeking to obtain from the Lord. This is the reward that God has promised to all those that serve Him. Romans 1 and verse number 1. One and one, you go ahead when you get there. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Called to be an apostle. He was appointed to do this. Go ahead. Separated unto the gospel of God. And the gospel of God is that he sent his only begotten son to die for the sins of the world, and that he's going to set up a kingdom here on this earth. And Paul was commissioned to go and preach that message. But go ahead. Which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. They had foretold of the coming of the Lord and the setting up of his king. Go ahead. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. That he rose from the dead. Go ahead. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Born in the flesh and crucified. But go ahead. And declared to be the son of God with power. With glory and honor. When? According, Go ahead. According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He is now what his father is. He is God. That's when he truly became the son of God. When he became what his father is. And that being God. And that occurred at his resurrection. Turn over Hebrews. The fifth chapter. And Paul lets us know that Jesus became the example for us to follow. And he tells us what it is that we must do in order to obtain that perfection. The ultimate reward that we should all be seeking is what you are serving God for in order to become God. Five and pick it up at verse number five and go ahead. 
Because again, he's going to tell us what it is that we need to do in order to obtain perfection. Go ahead. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. Because he was appointed to do this. But go ahead. But he that said unto him, uh -huh. Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And truly he became the son of God when he was raised from the dead. That's when he became what his father is. That's when he became God. But go ahead. As he said also in another place, uh -huh. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Because he is both king and priest, but I'm not dealing with that today. Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf. That is the job of the priest. But go ahead. On the days of his flesh, uh -huh. when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Go ahead. And was heard in that he feared. Again, he prayed to the Father. Because even though he came here to die for the sins of the world, he walked this earth as a flesh and blood man, and that was not his will. He did not want to die. No man wants to die. But go ahead. So he prayed to the Father, if it be his will, to let that cup pass from him. But if not, thy will be Done. He came and he showed us again how we are to live our lives, how we are to be obedient unto the Lord. He was obedient, as Paul says, even unto death. Go ahead, he's going to let you know. Though he were a son, what? yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Again, as a man, and he was obedient even unto death. And because of his obedience, what took place? Go ahead. And being made perfect, uh -huh. he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. He said, and then being made perfect because he is God now. He is what his father is. And he received that reward. The father raised him from the dead because of his obedience. And he is letting us know, Paul is letting us know, it is because of our obedience. That we'll also receive that same reward. We will also be made perfect. That is if we obey God. Turn over the first Peter. The first chapter. Because again Jesus paved the way for us to come back from the dead. Paul said he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Just as he had to obey the Father, we have to obey Jesus if we want to receive the same reward that he received. And Peter here is going to let us know of one of the things that God commanded of us. He's going to remind us of what it is that we're supposed to do. 1 and verse number 13. 1 and 13. You go ahead when you get there. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. He's letting you know that there's Something that you have to do. He said, you gird up the loins of your mind and be what? Be so. Go ahead. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Talking about at his appearance. He said, and the hope that you have is not a hope as a wish. It is as an assurance that your deliverance will occur. When the Lord makes his second coming, he's going to deliver his. But go ahead. As obedient children, uh -huh. not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy. What? So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. He said the one that has called you is holy. And he said, so be ye holy. He, he said in all manner of conversation, how you live this life, you have to live a godly life. If you want to become what God is, you got to live this life is God now to become what he is later. He said, but as he which is called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life. Go ahead. Because it is written. What? Be ye holy, for I am holy. So he's telling you, you got to be holy. And if he's telling you that, then it must be a way for you to accomplish that. Because God is not going to tell you to do anything that you cannot do. Because he is a righteous and a just God. And he told us to be holy, did he not? He said, because it is written. Turn over to Leviticus, the 19th chapter. Because we're going to see where it's written. That we are to be holy. 
and we're going to find out what it is we have to do in order to accomplish this. What it is that makes one whole. 19 and verse number 1, you go ahead when you get there. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go ahead. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel. And mind you, understand this. Who's doing the talking here? This is God, is it not? And with some understanding, you realize this is none other than Jesus himself. Because he is the only God that man has ever known. The Father, you've never seen his shape or heard his voice at any time. This is Jesus. He was God in the beginning. He took on the form of a flesh and blood man so that he could die for the sins of the world. Because God is a spirit. His spirits cannot die. That's why he had to come and walk this earth as a flesh and blood man. But here, he is instructing Moses as to what it is that he's supposed to tell the rest of the children of Israel. He said, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and tell them what? Go and ahead. say unto them, uh -huh. ye shall be holy. Go ahead. I am the Lord your God am holy. So he's telling them they must be holy. He said, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And this is what Peter was quoting. And now he's going to tell us what it is that we need to do in order to accomplish what he has commanded us. He's telling us to be holy, and now he's telling us what it is we must do in order to reach that state. Go ahead. Ye shall fear every man his mother uh -huh. and his father. And do what? And keep my son. Go ahead. I am the Lord your God. So being obedient to God's commandments is what makes you holy. He told them to be holy. He said, I, the Lord your God, am holy. And he told them, you should fear every man his mother and his father. It's part of the Ten Commandments. What does it say? Honor your father and your mother. He says, and keep my what? He said, and keep my Sabbaths. The Sabbaths belong not unto man, not unto Israel, not unto the Jews. There's no such thing as a Christian Sabbath that has any significance or importance unto God. God is the one that issued the commands concerning his Sabbath. He says, six days you shall work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In all your dwellings, wherever you are and whoever you are, if you are seeking to worship the true and living God, you must do it in accordance to his commandments. Because that's what makes you holy in the eyes of God. Matter of fact, go on your place right here. We're coming right back. Turn to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Because we're going to see what else is keeping the commandments of God constitute when it comes to man. Deuteronomy 6. Keep your place in Leviticus. We're coming right back. Because he told you to keep his Sabbath, did he not? Yes. Keep his commandments. Because he's telling you these are the things that you must do in order to be deemed holy in the eyes of God. But Deuteronomy 6 and verse number 1, because Moses is going to tell us something else about the commandments of God. Go ahead. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. These are God's commandments. They don't belong unto Israel. They don't belong unto man. God gave them unto Israel, and Israel was supposed to teach the rest of the sons of Adam how to serve the true and living God. He said, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. That you might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. Again, these are God's commandments. Drop down to verse number 24 and go ahead. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. Uh -huh. To fear the Lord our God. Go ahead. Who are good always. Uh -huh. That he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And if we do as God commanded us. What will that constitute? Go ahead. And it shall be our righteousness. Uh-huh. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. So if we want to be holy in the eyes of God, if we want to be righteous in the eyes of God, what is it that we must do? We have to keep God's commandments as he commanded us. That's what's going to lead to us obtaining the ultimate, the ultimate reward. And that is being made God. That is obtaining true perfection, being where our Father is, being holy and righteous, being God. But you will only acquire that by keeping His commands. 
turn back to Leviticus, the 19th chapter, because he said, Be ye holy, for I'm holy. He told us to fear every man, his mother and his father. He says, to keep my Sabbath. He said, I'm the Lord your God. Verse number four, go ahead. What else are we not supposed to do? Turn ye not unto idols. Uh-huh. Nor make to yourselves molten gods. Go ahead. I am the Lord your God. Because he tells you he's a jealous God. Have no other gods before me. Drop down to verse number 11 and go ahead. Because he's telling us what it is that we need to do concerning our worship of him. And also our treatment of one another. And it is the obedience to these commandments that determine your righteousness. It determines you being holy in the eyes of God. Go ahead. You shall not steal. Uh, neither deal falsely. Go ahead. Neither lie one to another. Don't bear false witness. Go ahead. And you shall not swear by my name false. Go ahead. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. You say, look. Tells you in another place, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Don't sit there and profess to believe in God. Go through the motions of trying to, to serve Him if you're not going to do it in accordance to what's written. Because as Jesus said in another place, your worship of me will be in vain for the teaching of doctrines, the commandments of men. If you obey God according to what man said, it is of no value to you. It is a waste of time. But go ahead. 13. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor. Uh-huh. Thou the rock. Go ahead. The wages of him that is higher shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. If you owe somebody something, what are you to do? You are to pay them. But go ahead. Thou shalt not curse the death. Uh-huh. Nor put a stumbling block before the blind. Look, don't take advantage of the less forged. But go ahead. But shalt fear thy God. Uh -huh. I am the Lord. What? You shall do no unrighteousness and just. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor. Go ahead. Nor honor the person of the mighty. God is not a respecter of person, and He's telling us we are not supposed to be a respecter of person. Don't favor one because of their condition, whether they be poor or whether they be rich. Don't side with them because of their status in life. You are supposed to do what? Exercise righteous judgment. But go ahead. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy name. But what else are we not supposed to do? Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Uh -huh. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. He said, look, don't bear false witness on nobody. Don't slander nobody. Don't disparage their character. You're not supposed to be doing any of these things. But go ahead, verse number 17. What else are we not supposed to do? Thou shalt not hate thy brother and thy heart. In other words, you got to be forgiving because God is a forgiving God. Is he not? So we also have to be forgiving. God is a merciful God. We also have to be merciful. These are the attributes that you are supposed to acquire. Because these are the things that allow you to fulfill the will of God. You got to treat one another in accordance to God's commands. And again, that's not something that's easy to do. That's a mindset that you have to acquire. That is the perfection that we are seeking here while we're on this earth, in this flesh and blood body. And if we achieve that, then we can be assured that we're going to achieve the perfection that Jesus received. That's the ultimate reward. He said, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart and your mind. Thou what? Go ahead. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. You surely correct him in what? And not suffer sin upon him. Don't bear sin because of him. Go ahead. Thou shalt not avenge. Go no. Go ahead. Nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. The Lord will execute vengeance. He tells you, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. He said, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But well, what are we supposed to do? But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. When asked what are the two great commandments, what did Jesus say? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you do that, then you're not going to do anything to offend God. And you're not going to do anything that will bring harm to your neighbor. 
But again, to acquire that mindset, that's not a normal mindset. We're going to see as we go through the course of this lesson. To be holy is required of us. But to get there is more it's easier said than done. But it can be done. Otherwise, God would not require it of us. He said, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, I am the Lord. Drop down. I'm sorry, go right into the 20th chapter. Because we're going to see we have to keep all of God's commandments. The royal law, which is known as the Ten Commandments. The dietary laws, the moral laws. His laws govern his holy day. His Sabbaths, 21, go ahead. I'm sorry, 27, thank you. Go ahead. Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Now he's telling you, you got to set yourself apart. But again, in order to sanctify yourself, he's going to tell you, you got to sanctify yourself by his word. He says, sanctify yourselves therefore, and do what? And be holy. He said, for I am the Lord your God. You ought to be sanctified, and you are going to be sanctified by the word of God. That's what makes you holy. Being obedient. Being in obedience to his word. But go ahead. And ye shall keep my statutes uh -huh. and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Again, God sanctifies us. He sanctifies us by his word. That is if you are being obedient to it. That's what makes you righteous. That's what makes you holy. That's what sanctifies you. Sets you apart from the rest of the world. But go ahead. For every one that cursed his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Uh-huh. He hath cursed his father or his mother. Go ahead. His blood shall be upon him. Uh-huh. And the man that committed the adultery with another man's wife. What? Even he that committed the adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Y'all should not commit adultery. Because what is the punishment for adultery? He's telling you you're going to be put to death. So again, he's telling us what it is we need to do in order to serve him and how we ought to treat one another. But drop down to verse number 13 and go ahead. If a man also lie with mankind. He's talking about homosexuality here. Go ahead. As he lieth with a woman. What? Both of them have committed an abomination. Go ahead. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So what people now refer to as an alternative lifestyle, God called what? It was an abomination. And when I said it was an abomination, make, let me make sure I clarify. It was an abomination then. It's an abomination now. And it will always be an abomination. I don't care how many people clamor about it. I don't care what kind of laws that they put on the books regarding it. It will always be an abomination to the Lord. Because the same God that tells you that he's holy is the same God that tells you I change not. How can you change it? How can you serve a God who changes his mind all the time? You won't know what it is that you need to do in order to serve him. Because today it might be a problem, but tomorrow it might be all right. That's not the mind of God. That's not a God that you can serve. The God that we serve is all powerful and all knowing. And what he set in motion from the very beginning is still good until this day and will be until the end of this world. Again, he said, it was an abomination. Don't do it. Drop down to verse number 25 and go ahead. You shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean. Go ahead. And between unclean fowls and clean. And do what? And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beasts or by fowl. Go ahead. Or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground. Which is what? Which I have separated from you as unclean. So he gave us the dietary law. He told us what it is you can and cannot eat. And when you eat something that is unclean, when you eat something that's contrary to God's dietary law, you've made yourself abominable unto the Lord. He says, and I've separated from you as unclean. His word is telling us what it is that we can and cannot do. Go ahead. 26. 
and ye shall be holy unto me. Go ahead. For I, the Lord, am holy. Uh -huh. And have severed you from other people. That ye should be mine. He said, and again, he reiterates, you to be holy unto me. And what makes us holy unto the Lord? Just a proclamation that we love him? No. He said, you shall be holy unto me. He said, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have severed you from other people, separated you, that you should be mine. But you belong unto the Lord. You are his servant as long as you are willing to obey him. But turn over to Isaiah the 65th chapter. Because he told us to be sanctified, did he not? He told us to be holy. And he showed us what it is that sanctifies us. The word of God. What constitutes you being holy is being obedient unto God's commands. But we're going to find out what's going to take place with those who refuse to obey God who purified themselves and sanctified themselves not in accordance to God's word, but by enough. 65 and 1. And go ahead. I am sought of them that ask not for them. Talking about the other nations. Go ahead. I am found of them that sought me not. Uh -huh. I said, behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. He's talking about unto the Gentiles, because God came unto Israel. Because Israel was supposed to be a holy nation, the kingdom of priests. And again, they were to teach the rest of the sons of Adam about the true and living God. But go ahead. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. This is Israel. Go ahead. Was walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Again, according to their own will, to, according to their own understanding. The Bible tells us there's a way that seemeth right unto man that leadeth unto death. But go ahead. A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face. Uh -huh. And sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. Because the Lord told us, don't have any other gods before me. I am a jealous God. And Israel got off into idol worship. But go ahead. What else is it that they do? Which remain among the grave. Uh -huh. Lodge in the monument. Talking about the spiritually dead. In these huge churches. Have built these huge edifices unto the Lord, which means absolutely nothing to God. Because again, you cannot worship God any way you want to. It has to be in accordance to his commandments. Otherwise, he's not going to recognize it. It's not going to be of any value. But go ahead. Which eats wine's flesh. Uh -huh. The broth of abominable things is in their vessel. Eating things that are unclean. Things that make them abominable. When he says swine's flesh, we know what the swine is. That's the pig, the catfish, the shrimp. Anything that is unclean makes that person abominable unto the Lord. Go ahead. Which, but what do they say? Which say? Stand by thyself. Uh-huh. Not near to me. Because they think, in their own mind, they think that they know God. People, as Paul said, talking about Israel, I bet them reckon. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that stands true even unto this day. But not just Israel, the world as a whole. People worship God, or what I say, call themselves worshiping God, but it is not in accordance to His truth. All you have to do is look around. People have no understanding when it comes to the Word of God. They have no understanding when it comes to this Bible. The Bible is the, as far as books, there's no other book that has been in print like the Bible. But it is a book that is totally misunderstood. People have it in their possession, but it might as well just be a paperweight. Because again, if you serve God and it's not according to his commandments, that's futile. It's a waste of time, but yet people are doing it wholesale. They're saying, stand by. 
thyself. Don't come near to me because I'm holier than thou. How can you be holy? Or how can somebody say they are holy and they are going contrary to the word of God? They're going contrary to the very thing that makes one holy. If you are not following God's commandments, there's no way that you can be holy in the eyes of God. Go ahead, what did the Lord say? These are a smoke in my nose. Go ahead. A fire that burneth all the day. He said, look, these are irritant unto me. He said, these are a smoke in my nose. He said, and a fire that burneth all the day. What is the Lord going to do? Go ahead. Behold, it is rich uh -huh. before me. What? I will not keep silence. We serve a merciful God. We serve a long-suffering God. But we also serve a God that's going to be full of wrath. A God that's coming back to execute vengeance. He's going to let you know. Go ahead. But we'll recompense. Even recompense into their books. He's letting them know they are going to pay for the error of their way. There's no reason for us not to know what it is that we ought to do. God gave his word to his prophets. They wrote them down. We're reading them. Jesus himself came. And he reiterated or emphasized the fact the need to be obedient to his word. And the Lord is going to pay all those, all those that refuse to obey. Turn over to Isaiah the 66 chapter, because he said he's going to recompense, he's going to reward them. What is he going to do? 66, and pick it up at verse number 15. Because here Isaiah is talking about the coming of the Lord and what it is he's going to do once he gets here. Go ahead. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. I tell you what, read verse number 13. Go ahead. As one whom his mother Comfort. Uh -huh. So will I comfort you. And he shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Talking about his return. Talking about his chosen people, Israel. Because Israel is the black people that were scattered into slavery all over this world and will be in captivity until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus tells you that. But go ahead. And when ye see this, uh -huh. your heart shall rejoice. Go ahead. Your bones shall flourish like an earth. Uh -huh. And the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants. Uh -huh. And his indignation toward his enemies. He said, when you see this, he said, your mind is going to rejoice. He said, your bones will flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord shall be known towards what? Towards his servants. But indignation towards his enemies. And Paul knows you tells you. He said, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself service to obey. That's whose servant ye are. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So to be a servant unto the Lord you must be obedient to his commands. But then those that refuse to obey are going to bear God's indignation. What is the Lord going to do? Verse 15. Go ahead. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. Uh huh. And with his chariots like a whirlwind. To do what? To render his anger with you. Uh huh. And his rebuke with flames of fire. Go ahead. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. And when he talks about the Lord pleading, he's not talking about let's sit down and having a conference. He's talking about the Lord is going to be killing from one end of this earth to the other. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the Jesus that people say loves everybody. We don't see that. He said, for by fire and by a sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. He's just going to speak the word and it's going to be done. The blood of man, it's going to be so much blood tells you revelation it's going to be a river of blood up to the horse's bridle, up to the horse's mouth. He said the Lord is going to plead with all flesh. Go ahead. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. And who's going to be among those that are slain? Go ahead. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst. Doing what? Eating swine's flesh. The Lord told us to be sanctified. Did he not? He told us to be holy. Did he not? 
but he told us to do so in accordance to his word, not to come up with our own. See, we serve God. God does not serve us. But man, because he does not want to submit his will unto God, they concocted a God of convenience. And that God cannot deliver anybody. But the God of this Bible is telling us that he's going to be killing from one end of this earth to the other. They say the slain of the Lord shall be many. And amongst those slain are going to be those that sanctify themselves. They set themselves apart. Not by the word of God, but by man's commandments. They purify themselves in the guards behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and, and the mouth. What's going to happen to them? Go she ahead. Shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Verse number 18. Go ahead. Well, I know their works and their thoughts. Uh -huh. Shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. Because we're going to see the one that's going to be doing all of this is none other than Jesus. Because he told us, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if, for those that refuse to do so, he's going to deal with them according. 2 Thessalonians 1, and pick it up at verse number 7. 1 and 7. Because Paul is telling you who it is that's coming back in flame and fire. Go ahead. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Go ahead. And flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Uh -huh. That obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it says the Lord is going to plead with all flesh in this land. And the Lord is going to be many. Paul's letting us know the one that's going to be doing this is none other than Jesus. He said, you that are troubled, you rest with us. When Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead, what's going to happen with them? Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Which simply means they're going into the lake of fire. Go ahead. And from the glory of his power. Turn over to Romans, the 12th chapter. Jesus is telling us what it is that we need to do. Paul told us he's the author of our salvation. Did he not? Yes. But then deliverance is to those who obey him. <clears throat> he told us we got to be holy as he is holy. And Paul here is going to reiterate that same message. But he's going to let us also know something. We are responsible for doing that, but he also lets us know that in order for us to truly be holy, to truly be righteous, we need to acquire us a different mindset. Because oh, obey God goes against man's very nature. To be truly holy, again, goes against the mindset of a natural man. But 12 and 1, go ahead. I beseech you therefore, brother, uh -huh. by the mercies of God, what? that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, go ahead. holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Now he's telling us to do this, and we are all responsible for this. This is our responsibility. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. He said, which is your reasonable service. And be what? And be not conformed to this world. But what? And be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh-huh. And ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said, and don't be conformed to this world. You got to separate yourself, but you got to be sanctified by the word of God. He said, and you got to be transformed, he said, by the renewing of your mind. You got to acquire you a, a new mindset. He said that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Turn to Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. And 
what Paul is saying is nothing new because the Lord here is speaking to Israel is telling them about the need of acquiring a new mindset. And that's what being perfect is about. Acquiring a mindset that enables you to live this life in accordance to all of God's will. Ezekiel 18. And pick it up at verse number 4. 18 and 4. You go ahead when you get there. Behold, all souls are mine. Uh -huh. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. He's simply saying all individuals belong to me. God created all things, including man. And he says in all souls or all individuals are mine. The soul of the Father, the soul of the Son is mine. Go ahead. The soul that sin. What's going to happen? It shall die. He said all individuals belong to me. And the one that sinned, he is going to perish. He is going to die. And sin is the transgression of the law. Same law that you need to obey in order to be deemed righteous and holy in the eyes of God is the same law that will sentence you as being a sinner because of your transgression of it. And it is the breaking of that law that will lead to one's death. He said, all souls belong to me, and the soul that sinned is going to die. But drop down to verse number 21, because God is a merciful God. I'm sorry. Pardon me. No, 21. Verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed uh -huh. and keep all my statutes. He's simply telling us you got to repent. He said all souls belong to him and the soul that sin, the individual that sins, he's going to die. He said, but if the wicked will turn, he has to repent from all of his sins. Stop doing those things that are contrary to the Lord and keep his statutes and do what? And do that which is lawful and right. What's going to happen? He shall surely live. He shall not die. Because the Lord is a merciful God, a God who is willing to forgive. But again, what he's saying is you have to repent. Go ahead, verse 22. All his transgressions that he hath committed. What? They shall not be mentioned unto him. They'll be forgiven. Go ahead. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. He said, and in his righteousness, in his obedience, in him being holy, he said, in his righteousness that he had done, he is going to live. But it's all predicated on what? Predicated on that individual repenting. Predicated on that individual having a change of heart or a change of mind. We're going to see. Go ahead. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Said the Lord God. God created all things and all things were created for his pleasure. He says, I, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked shall die? He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But go ahead. And now that he should return from his ways and live. This is what the Lord desires, is that man would repent from his wicked or evil ways and start to be obedient unto him. He said, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked shall die, said the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live. Drop down to verse number 31. Go ahead. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Go ahead. Whereby ye have transgressed. All the things that have caused you to go contrary to God, you have to rip them out of your out of your life. He said, cast away from you all your transgressions by, whereby ye have transgressed and do what? And make you a new heart and a new spirit. Creating you a new mindset. Because when God created man, he gave man free will. And the whole problem with this is we don't want to obey God. It is that simple. Man refuses to obey God. And he's telling us, you've got to create in you a new mindset, a new spirit. One that will enable you.
to obey God's every will. He said, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make a new heart and a new spirit. Go ahead. But why will ye die, O house of Israel? Go ahead. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. God. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he's letting you know, but I will kill you. He said, For I have no pledge in the death of him that died, said the Lord. Wherefore what? Wherefore turn yourselves and live you. You got to change. You got to create in you a new mindset, a new spirit. Turn to Ephesians. The fourth chapter. Because the Lord is telling us what it is that we need to do to be holy and righteous. And that is to be obedient unto him. But at the same time, recognize that man is not going to do that overnight. He's telling you, you got to have a change in heart, a change in mind. You can't continue to do the things that you want to do in accordance to your own desires, in accordance to your own lust, in accordance to your own wisdom and understanding. You got to start being obedient unto God. Eight, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4 and verse Number 17. We're going to look at one because Paul told us, Be ye not of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Did he not? And we're going to look at what one looks like who's had a renewing of their mind. Four, pick it up at verse number 17. Four and 17. You go ahead when you get there. This I say, therefore. And testify in the Lord. Uh-huh. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. That do what? In the vanity of their mind. They're walking in the futility of their own thoughts. And now being a servant of God, you can no longer continue to do what it is that you used to do. He said, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth don't continue to do this. Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the Vanity or futility of their mind, having what? Having the understanding dark. Go ahead. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. He said, Look, and having an understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance. He said, Because of the blindness of their own minds. Go ahead, 19. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. To do what? To work all uncleanness with greediness. Go ahead. But ye have not so learned Christ. Uh-huh. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now once you come to the Lord, what is it that you have to do? Verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man. That old way of living. He said that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is what? Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Which is corrupt in his own thinking. You got to have a change in mind, a change in spirit. He said put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be what? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He said, and be renewed or transformed by the renewing of your mind. He said, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You got to replace your thoughts with God's thoughts. So that your ways can become like God's ways. Because we naturally are contrary to the Lord. So there has to be a renewing of the mind. Go ahead. And that you put on the new man. Go ahead. Which after God is created in righteousness and true hope. He said that you put on the new man. This man that has been created in righteousness and true holiness. Patterned after God. Go ahead. Wherefore putting away lying. Uh-huh. Make every man truth with his name. Go ahead. For we are members one of another. Uh-huh. Be ye angry and sin not. Go ahead. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. This is what this new man is going to be like. This one that's had a renewing of their spirit. He said you put away lying and speak every man truth with his neighbor. You be honest with one another. He said we are, he said we're for put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. He said, but we are members one of another. He said, be ye angry, but don't sin. See, people think as a servant of God that you somehow are not supposed to get angry. 
Nothing is supposed to upset you or irritate you. He's telling you, be angry. He said, but don't sin. Don't get angry to the point that you want to seek vengeance. Because then you want to get yourself in trouble. If something angers you, then you let that individual know what it is that they've done that has upset you. Give them the opportunity to correct the situation. Don't harbor ill feelings because to sit around and harbor ill feelings, eventually you're going to want to get back at that person. So he said, be ye angry, but don't sin. Go ahead. 27. Now to give place to the devil. Go ahead. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good. Uh-huh. And he may have to give to him that need. And look, he's talking about a change of mind even to the point that the thief now, instead of stealing from his people for his own benefit, he's going to work, he's going to labor, and he's going to share with others. He said, let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that is in need. Rather than being a parasite, leeching off of people, stealing, you go and you labor. And not only do you labor for your own benefit, you labor and you let others who are in need share in your labor. Go ahead, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that is what? But that which is good to the use of edifying. Uh-huh. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Go ahead. Not only your behavior, the things that you do, your whole conversation is to change. But go ahead. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Uh-huh. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Go ahead. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Paul is letting us know there must be a change that should occur in the one that calls himself a child of God. If you're serving the Lord, again, there needs to be a change in your behavior, a change in even how you communicate with one another. And that change could only occur if there's a change in your spirit, a change in your mindset. He said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and blasphemy be put away from you with all wickedness. Verse number 32, how are you supposed to be? And be ye kind one to another, tender heart. He said, you got to be compassionate. Sympathetic. Doing what? Forgiving one another. Go ahead. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So you got to change. You got to start taking on an attribute to the God that you serve. If your quest is to become God, you have to start being like God now so that you can become God later. Turn over to James, the second chapter. But Paul said, be ye kind one to another. Tender heart. You got to be compassionate, sympathetic, one to another. And James reiterates that here, talking about one's faith. Because at times it's easy to be misled into thinking that if I serve God, if I keep his Sabbath days, if I attend the feast, that I've, I've done all that I need to do. No, you got to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and you got to love your neighbor as yourself. You got to try and do the complete will of God. When I say try, because that's what God is requiring of us. But James 2 and verse number 14, 2 and 14, you go ahead when you get there. What doth it profit, my brother? Though a man say he hath faith, and have none works, can uh -huh. faith save him? So he's asking a question, he's going to give us an example of what he's talking about. He said, what does it profit an individual, my brother, if a man say he has faith and does not have any works? He does not have any actions that demonstrate the so-called faith that he's proclaiming to have. He said, what profit is it to him? Go ahead. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, uh -huh. and one of you say unto them, 
Depart in peace. What? Be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What? What doth it profit? He said, look, if someone comes unto you and they are in need, he said, be they naked and destitute of daily food. And what you have for them is some warm speech, some warm words. He said, one of you say unto them, depart in peace and be ye warmed and feel you're wishing them well. But then you didn't give them any of the things that they are in desperate need of. And this is assuming that you're in a position to help somebody, but yet and still you are refusing to help. But you have some kind words for them. You have some words of advice. He said, you tell them, depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. He said, what got it profit then? Didn't profit them, but he's telling an individual that takes that position is not going to profit them either. Go ahead. Even so faith, uh -huh. if it have not works, is dead being alone. He said, even so faith, if it does not have the works, if it does not have the activity that evidences it, he said, it is dead being alone. Just to profess to, to believe is not enough in and of itself. It's just like we were reading about those in Isaiah that say, come not near unto me, for I'm holier than thou. To proclaim to be a child of God means nothing. To proclaim to be a Christian or a follower of Christ means nothing if they don't have the activity to support that. But go ahead. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. But James is simply saying, to say you have faith, or to say that you believe in God, that you love him, in and of itself is not enough. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. True faith does not have to be spoken of. True faith is demonstrated. It's demonstrated in your service of God. It's demonstrated in your treatment of one another. Turn over to Matthew, the 25th chapter. But Jesus utilizes this pair to show us the importance of how we treat one another. Because he told us to be holy, did he not? And again, in being holy and being obedient to the commandments of God, the commandments that pertain to the worship and service of God and the commandments that pertain to the treatment of one another. 25 and verse number 31. 25 and 31, because this is the Lord talking about what he's going to do at his second coming. Go ahead when you get there. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, uh -huh. and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Talking about the Kingdom's going to be established here on this earth because Jesus is coming back. He said, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Go ahead. That's why he tells us, you pray thy kingdom come. You pray for the coming of the kingdom of God. And what is he going to do? Go and ahead. before him shall be gathered all nations. Uh -huh. And he shall separate them one from another. Go ahead. As a shepherd divided the sheep from the goat. Uh huh. What is he going to do with the sheep? And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Uh huh. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, he blessed of my father. They truly will be blessed. Go ahead. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, the ones he set on his right hand, he said he's going to tell them, Come, ye blessed of my father. You're getting into God's kingdom. You inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he's going to tell them why they're getting this inheritance. Go ahead. For well, I wasn't hungry and you gave me meat. Uh -huh. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Go ahead. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. These are those that had pity and compassion. They showed kindness. They were merciful. These are the ones, he said, are going to inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. But what did 
they who he was talking to say unto him. Go ahead, verse 37. Then shall the righteous answer him, uh -huh. saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee? Go ahead. Or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in? Uh -huh. Or naked and clothed thee? Go ahead. When saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? They say, when did we do these things that you say that we did? Go ahead, what did Jesus tell them? And the king shall answer and say unto them, uh -huh. Verily I say unto you, What? And as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye uh -huh. have done it unto me. Look, when you love your neighbors, you love yourself. When you love your neighbors, you love yourself, as God commanded us to do. You're demonstrating to God your belief and your faith in Him by carrying out His command. So what you've done to your brother, the Lord has said, in essence, you've done unto me. So the kindness that you show to one another, the Lord thinks that kindness is being demonstrated unto him. But also, the ill treatment that we could show to one another, the Lord is saying, I'm also taking that ill treatment being done unto me. Verse 41, and go ahead. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, uh -huh. Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is their judge. And why is this taking place with them? Go ahead. Well, I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. Uh -huh. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. He said, what, like the, that James say? Depart, and be ye filled. But go ahead, he said, I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. He said, I was estranged, and you wouldn't take me in. Naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison. You didn't bother to visit me. Go ahead, verse number 44. And what is their, what is their answer going to be? Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, uh -huh. when saw we thee in hunger, and or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? When then, did we do these things? Because these are people that are seeking to get into God's kingdom. These are people that think they know the Lord. They say, when did we ever do these things? We didn't minister unto thee. What did the Lord say? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Look, not caring for one another is the same as not caring for the Lord. <coughs> go ahead. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, uh -huh. and the righteous into life eternal. And again, it tells you in another place, He that doeth righteous is righteous. What constitutes you being righteous is your obedience unto God's commands. All of God's commands. Turn over to Matthew, the 19th chapter. But in order to do what God is commanding us, that's, that takes work. That takes effort on our part. that growth is what's necessary because that leads us to being perfect and that will ensure that we'll receive the reward that we all should be seeking and that is eternal life but Matthew 19 verse number 16 and Jesus shows us here the need for growth. We should continue to be trying to grow while we're in this world. We shouldn't be sitting, being stagnant, thinking because of the knowledge that we have that everything is okay. We can all grow. There's always room to better oneself. 19 and 16, as Jesus demonstrates here. Because they're going to ask him, a question about eternal life. Go ahead when you get there. And the whole one came and said unto him, uh -huh. Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So this individual has some understanding because he realizes that he has to do something in order to receive the reward from the Lord. He said, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may lay hold on eternal life? Go ahead. 
And he said unto him, What? Why callest thou me good? Go ahead. There is none good but one. That is God. Again, Jesus came and he gave us the example as to how we are to serve the Lord. He paid homage to the Father. He said, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one. That is God. And now he's going to answer the question. And what is that? But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Again. If you want to lay hold on eternal life, he said, you got to keep the commandments. Go ahead. What did he say? He said unto him which? And the same commandments that constitute you being righteous, the same commandments that constitute you being holy. These are the commandments you have to keep if you want to inherit the kingdom of God. He said unto him which? And Jesus is going to let him know. Go ahead. Thou shalt do no murder. Go ahead. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Go ahead. Honor thy father and thy mother. And do what? And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He gave five of the ten commandments and then he gave one of the great commandments. Same commandments that we read about in Leviticus, did we not? That you have to keep in order to be deemed holy in the eyes of God. The same commandments that Moses talked about. If we do all these commandments that the Lord our God has given us to do, that will be our righteousness. The same commandments that constitute you being righteous and holy in the eyes of God is the same commandments that you must keep if you want to lay hold on eternal life. What did the young man tell him? Go ahead. The young man said unto him, uh -huh. All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? He said, I've done these. He said, all of them I've kept from my youth up. He said, well, what is it that I'm lacking in? What did Jesus tell him? Go ahead. Jesus said unto him. What? Thou wilt be perfect. He said, but if you want to be perfect, what does this young man need to do? Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. Uh-huh. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. He said, if you want to be perfect, you got to extend yourself. He said, you go and you sell what it is that you have and then you give it to the poor. He said, and told him, you come and follow me. But what did the young man do? Go ahead. But when the young man heard this, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. No problem with it was, he had more, he had more of an attachment to his possessions than he did with wanting to serve the Lord. But it tells you in another place that Jesus loved that man, that young man. Now he had done, had he not, he said, all the things that Jesus said, all the things you said I've done for my youth up. He said, what is it that I lack, though? He said, but if you want to be perfect, you go and you sell what you have, and then you give that unto the poor. And the thing is, what we want to do is to be in the same position. Because if we profess to truly believe God, if we possess, profess to believe in his word, eventually, it's going to come to pass. And what am I talking about? Eventually, you're going to have to stand before your maker. And eventually, you're going to have to give an account of the things that you've done in this life. And what you want to be able to do is to be like that young man and say, I've done all I was, could do. I've done all that you've asked me to do. That's not the time to be thinking about, oh, I should have done more, or I could have done more. This is the time to prepare yourself to meet God. When you're in the presence of the Lord, that is not the time. Because we talk about the Lord coming back, and I believe that with all, with every fiber in my being, I believe it just like I believe he's gonna set up a kingdom on this earth. But I also believe that what he is telling us, we must subscribe to. We must do it. My quest is to get into God's kingdom. That's what I want. That is it. And what he's telling me, what I'm reading, what I'm getting out of this book is, you got to be obedient in order to receive the reward that he has promised. And he's showing us that same message over and over and over again. The fundamental principle he's shown in the Bible. Obey me and all will be well. 
that started all the way back with Adam, when the Lord created the Garden of Eden. <coughs> and he made to grow every tree that was good for food. And he placed man in the garden, he said, of every tree thou mayest freely eat. Let him know, if you obey me, everything will be well. He said, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of that tree, because in the day that you do, you're going to surely die. If you obey me, all will be well. You'll be well taken care of. But if you disobey me, you are going to suffer the consequences. Man disobeyed God, and we've been suffering ever since. This is our last chance. We got this physical death coming. If we don't live until the second coming of the Lord, all of us are going to go back to the dust of the ground. All of us are going to die. But that's not the end of the story. All of us are going to have to be raised from the dead and have to give an account of the things that we've done in this body. This is the time to prepare yourself to meet your God. That's what this is all about. And if you want to assure yourself of a good reward, then you got to be obedient to his commandments. The commandments that he's given in terms of how to serve and worship him and the commandments that he's given in terms of how you are to treat one another. But turn over to Matthew, the fifth chapter. With all the man, all that that young man had done, Jesus let him know what? There was still room for growth. And nowhere will you find when he's telling you, well, you won't get in because of all that great knowledge you have. You need the knowledge because you need the knowledge to develop your mind. You need the knowledge of what pleases God so you knew, you'll know what it is that you should and should not do. You need the knowledge, but you got to put that knowledge into use. 5 and verse number 38. We have to go we'll see how far we have to go in terms of acquiring a godly mindset. 5 and 38. Because here Jesus continues to show us how we are to treat one another. Matthew 5 and 38. You go ahead when you get there. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a mm -hmm. tooth for a tooth. What he's simply talking about when he said, You've heard that it's been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He's not talking about individual retaliation. Somebody put out your eye, then you go put out their eye. No, he's talking about because the nation itself, when he set up the nation of Israel, it was set up to judge. But go ahead, verse number 39. But I say unto you, uh -huh. that ye resist not evil. Go ahead. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And look, he said, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil. He said, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And people will take this and say, you're not talking about literally, you let somebody just stand there and beat on you. But don't allow yourself to be revoked into an altercation. It used to be, it, it used to be in a culture, if before the man would duel, they would take out their glove and one of them would slap the other. And then they march off their March off so many paces, they turn around with their pistols and they shoot at one another. He's simply saying, look, don't allow yourself to be drawn in to an altercation. If somebody does something to you, they provoke you, you don't have to do something wrong to them because of the wrong that they've done unto you. There's means and methods by which you are to operate. He said, but I say, Resist not the evil. Whoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Go ahead, verse number 40. And if any man will sue thee at the law, uh -huh. take away that coat. What? Let him have thy cloak he also. Say, Look, if that's the judgment, then you have to go along with it. Go ahead. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. He's telling you, you need to fulfill your obligation. Verse 42. Go ahead. Give to him that asketh thee. Uh -huh. And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thy way. He said, give to him that asketh thee. If you have it, then you go ahead and give it. He said, give to him that asketh thee. 
And him that would borrow of thee, don't turn him away. And what are we going to find? He's not just talking about those that you are friendly with. He's not just talking about those you consider to be your friend. Go ahead. Or somebody that you feel, well, I'll give this person this because I know I'm going to get something in return from them. For what? Verse 43. You have heard that it has been said, uh -huh. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But well, what did Jesus say? Go ahead. But I say unto you, love your enemy. He said, look, don't be partial in your treatment of others. He said, but I say unto you, you love. He said, you've heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. He said, but I say unto you, you got to love your enemy. That's why I say it's, it's an acquiring of a different mindset. This goes against society as a whole. Because society teaches you from a very, 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 very young beginning. What are you supposed to do to your enemy? You destroy them down to the ground. You annihilate them. You obliterate them. You will wipe them off the face of the earth. You get somebody down and you make sure they don't get back up. But Jesus said, but I'm telling you, you got to love not just your neighbor. You got to love your enemy. Go ahead. Bless them that curse you. Uh -huh. Do good to them that hate you. Go ahead. And pray for them which despitefully use you and, and persecute you. And you got to learn to do this. You got to be willing to forgive. You got to be willing to relinquish all of that ill feeling you may have towards someone because they've offended you in some way, some form of fashion. He said, but I say to you, you got to love your enemies. You got to bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you. You got to have a godly mindset. Is this not what Jesus did for us? He loved us when we were yet his enemies. And he's telling us we got to turn around and do the same thing. Go ahead. That ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. Uh -huh. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. Go ahead. And send it rain on the just and on the unjust. Does, that, does not the Lord do that? Does not the Lord make it rain? He said, he said, he make it the rain on the just and the unjust. And the importance of that is, see, if you have no rain, then you'll have no crops. You have no crops, then you'll have no food. The Lord does not withhold his blessing. Even though man is wicked, and man as a whole is wicked, he said, but God still makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and send him rain on the just and the unjust. Go ahead. For if ye love them which love you, uh -huh. what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? Go ahead. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? He said, look, if you only do good to those who you consider your friends, he said, what reward will you receive for that? How are we supposed to be? Go ahead. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He's telling you, you got to be holy, and he's saying you got to be perfect. He said, be ye therefore perfect. He said, even as your Father which is in heaven is, is perfect. And we are responsible for this. And again, God would not tell us to do this if it's something that cannot be done. But to do this, you got to create in you a new mindset. When you come to the Lord, it's a journey in serving him. And that journey is a lifelong journey. And what we should always be trying to do is to grow. We should always be trying to expand our mind to the point or develop our mind to the point that we can do the complete will of God. When one is baptized, they went into an agreement between them and the Lord. And saying they're going to serve him. And Paul talks about it in Romans, the sixth chapter. Because when you go in the water, he talks about you going in the water. That old man being submerged in the water. And what's coming up is that new creature. But what goes in that water, I always say, is the same one that's coming up. The same you that went down in the water is the same you that's coming up. The only difference that there'll be here is in your mindset how you see things. And it's not something that's acquired overnight. You're supposed to grow and learn in this word. It's a continuing process. 
But we should never get complacent and think because of the knowledge that God has blessed us to have to say, well, I have enough. My knowledge is going to see me through. Or to look at somebody else that has no understanding and think that because of what they're doing, God's going to punish them. But I can't find in the Bible yet Well, I see that God is grading on a curve. He said, you got to be holy. He didn't say be holier than somebody else. He said, you got to be holy. He said, you got to be perfect. And then he's telling us what it is that we need to do in order to do these things. Turn over. Matter of fact, turn to Romans, the 12th chapter. Because he's talking about how you got to love your enemies. Paul's telling us the same thing here. You don't want to clarify that because it's not, it's not you placing yourself in a position where you are constantly being abused by somebody and telling yourself, well, I, I'm supposed to do this because he say love my enemy. So this individual is supposed to continue to, I'm supposed to continue to let this individual take advantage of me. Just like we read where he said, if somebody hits you on the right cheek, cheek, you turn the other cheek, and people think, well, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to stand there and let somebody beat me. No, he's not saying that. Listen to what Paul says here, 12 and verse number 9. Go ahead. Because Paul is talking about love here, but he's talking about a love without hypocrisy. Go ahead. Let love be without dissimulation. He's simply saying you can't be partial in your love. You can't love those who just love those whom you're familiar with or whom you like or who those who you have something in common with. He said, let love be without dissimulation and do what? Upon that which is evil. Uh-huh. Cleave to that which is good. Drop down to verse number 18. Go ahead. If it be possible, as much as lie in you. Do what? Live peaceably with all men. Notice Paul said, if it be possible, you do this. He said, if it be possible, as much lie is within you. All that is within your power. Then you live peaceably with all men. And he said, if it be possible, because sometimes it ain't going to be possible. But what you do is, sometimes you just have to separate yourself one for another, from another. He said, if it be possible, as much as lie within you, you live peaceably with all men. Go ahead. 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Why? For it is written. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And if you believe the Lord, then you're going to leave the vengeance up to him. He said, dearly beloved, don't avenge yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. He said, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, what? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Uh -huh. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. He said, look, therefore, if thine enemy is hungry, you got to turn around and feed him. But what is the natural mindset of man? If you see your enemy in a bad state, you're going to gloat over him. He said, but if your enemy is hungry, you got to turn around and feed him. And if he's thirsty, you got to give him something to drink. Now, an individual has treated you bad with disdain, and now they're in need, and they're coming to you. You can't take the position of, oh, I told you so, or you're gloating over their misfortune. He said, you got to turn around, and you got to help them. You gotta love not just your neighbor, you gotta love your enemy also. But turn over to Exodus, the 24th chapter. I'm sorry, the 23rd chapter. Because what Jesus is telling us and what Paul is telling us is, is not new. God has been telling us from the beginning how we're supposed to treat one another. How you gotta love not just those that you're familiar with, that you have something in common with. He said, even those that you have a problem with, you have to treat them with civility. You got to treat them in accordance to how God is commanding us to treat one another. 23, and pick it up at verse number 4. Go ahead when you get there. 23 and 4. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, uh -huh. thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. Now mind you, this is your enemy. This is your chance to get back at this person. Because you said in your mind, I don't like this individual, no way. You said, but he said, but if you meet your enemy's ass or his ox going astray, he said, thou shalt surely bring it back to him. And he said, you surely should do this because it would be a man's mindset not to do it. Go ahead, verse number five. 
And thou see the ass of him that hated that be lying under his burden. Uh huh. And what is for bear to help him? You don't want to help him, but what? Thou shalt surely help with him. He said, You surely gonna do this. This is your enemy. But you gotta do good unto him. Go ahead. Thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cup. Uh huh. Keep thee far from false matter. And the innocent and righteous slay thou not. For I will not justify the wicked. Again, to be perfect is to live this life according to God's complete will. It is not easy, but it can be done. Turn over to Genesis, the 17th chapter. Because what Jesus told us to do, even in sin and being perfect, is not anything that is new. And again, he wouldn't tell us to be or to do something that cannot be done. Because here the Lord is telling Abraham, he's getting ready to enter into a covenant with him. And that covenant is going to be contingent upon him being perfect. 17 of verse number 1. You go ahead when you get there. 17 and 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. He said, This is when the Lord appeared. This is before Abram's and before Abraham's name was changed. He said, When Abram was 90 years old and nine, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, He said, I am the Almighty God. He said, You walk before me and be perfect. And he'd do what? If Abraham was obedient, what was the Lord going to do? And I will make my covenant between me and thee. He said, I'll make an agreement with you. Go ahead. And will multiply thee exceeding. Drop down to verse number six and go ahead. And I will make thee exceeding food. Uh-huh. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in the generations for an everlasting covenant. It is to be forever. To do what? To be a God unto thee. Uh-huh. To thy seed after thee. And what is he going to give Abraham? In connection with this covenant that he was going to make with him. Go ahead. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Go ahead. The land wherein thou art a stranger. That's why it's called the promised land. The land of what? All the land of Canaan. Go ahead. For an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So all that God has promised to Abraham was continued upon what? Upon Abraham walking before him and being perfect. He said, you walk before me and be thou perfect. He said, and I'll establish my covenant with thee and thy seed after thee. And i give thee the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. So he told Abraham, Abraham was charged with what? With being perfect, was it not? Turn over to Genesis, the 26th chapter. Because we're going to see that Abraham did exactly as the Lord said or told him to. Because he said he was going to make his covenant with him and his seed after him. Now the covenant is getting ready to pass from Abraham to his son Isaac. And we're going to see why the covenant passed. Was passed from him. Was passed from Abraham down to his son. 26 and 1. And go ahead. Because the Lord is getting ready to appear unto Isaac. Go ahead. And there was a famine in the land. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech king of the Philistines unto Gerar. The Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Because he's letting him know he's going to take care of him. Go ahead. So join in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed. What is he going to do? I will give all these countries. And do what? And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. The Lord told him, he said, look, I'm going to do this. He said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you all these countries that I may perform the oath that I swore unto your father Abraham. Go ahead. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. Uh -huh. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why is he going to do this? Go ahead. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, uh -huh. and kept my charge, and did what? My commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Abraham walked before him and was perfect. Being perfect is what? 
being obedient to the commandments of God, developing a mindset that you can fulfill all that God has required, to live according to God's complete will. He said, because in Abraham obeyed my voice, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So he charged Abraham with being perfect, did he not? Abraham was perfect. It tells you, tell you what, turn over to Job, the first chapter. Read Job 1 and 1. What does it say there concerning Job? Because people talk about the patience of Job, but Job was a man of wisdom. Go ahead, a righteous, a just man. Go ahead. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. Go ahead. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and his few to eat. Drop down to verse number 8 and go ahead. Because we just read here where it says that Job was, a, he was perfect and upright. Did we not? A man that feared God. But verse number 8, go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, uh -huh. Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now there is none like him in the earth. How is he? A perfect and an upright man. This is God referring to Job as being a perfect and an upright man. He told Satan, if you consider my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, he said, a perfect and an upright man. One that does what? One that feared God and that you was evil. Turn over to 2 Peter, the first chapter. See, it can be done. But like with anything, if you have to do something, if you don't give it any consideration, chances are it won't get done. And that's what Peter is talking about here. Bringing it into their consciousness, the things that they need to do, to be concerned about. Because if you don't think about something, then you're not going to do it. Second Peter 2, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 1, and pick it up at verse number 2. 2 Peter 1 and 2. Because he's going to give us a litany litmus test here as to whether or not we have room for growth. And whenever I look at this and I deal with this, I always say this is not something for um, one to, to pass judgment on another and say, hey, I know this individual ain't like that. And it's not anything to become discouraged about. What it is, is to cause one to sit back and reflect and say, what is it that I need to do? What is it that I can do? to better myself, and to better my chances of getting into God's kingdom. So ultimately, that's all that matters. One, and pick it up at verse number two. What did Peter tell us? Go ahead. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Uh-huh. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And he did that through his word. He revealed it to us what it is his will is. Go ahead. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Uh-huh. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. The promises, the promise of eternal life. To all those that obey him. He said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That what? That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Uh-huh. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Go ahead. And beside this. What is it that we need to do? Giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue. He said besides this, he said giving all diligence, what we need to do, he said you add to your faith virtue. You add to your belief goodness. And what? And to virtue knowledge. Go ahead. And to knowledge temper. He said you add to your faith virtue of goodness and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control. And to self-control of temperance what? And to temperance patience. Go ahead. And to patience godliness. Talking about holiness. Go ahead. And to godliness brotherly kindness. Talking about none other than love. Go ahead. And to brotherly kindness charity. He said and to godliness brotherly kindness of love and to brotherly kindness charity. Ultimate love, being able to love one as yourself, not just those you are familiar with, those that you have something in common, common with, even being able 
to love your name. I'm sorry, love your enemy. That takes a certain, again, that's a development of growth that has to occur in all those who are trying to serve the Lord. He's telling, though, telling us these attributes that we're to acquire. Paul talks about it in Galatians when he talks about the fruits of the Spirit. He talks about love and joy and peace and long-suffering. You've got to learn to be merciful and be forgiving. When Peter's given us, Jesus had told him he gave him the keys of the king. These are the things that we're going to find if you have an abundance of these, or if you have these in possession, then an abundance of interest has been given unto you in terms of getting into God's kingdom. Because you wanted an assurance that you get into his kingdom. And you can know with all certainty whether or not you're doing what you should in order to get into God's kingdom. It shouldn't be a secret to you. Because as I say, we talk about the deep things, the profound things of God. We talk about what's going on in the Middle East, or whether or not the temple is going to be built, the coming of the Lord, the signs that he gave, understand all that, the European Union, what's going on with all that. But the question one needs to ask at the end of the day, if God is coming back, am I ready to stand before him? If God came through this door right now, am I ready to meet him? Can I say, safe, like Hezekiah did, when the Lord sent Isaiah to tell him, get your house in order, Hezekiah, because you know you're getting ready to die. And Hezekiah went and prayed to the Lord and told him, you know how I've served you with a perfect heart all these years. Can we say that? That's what you want to be able to do. That's what this is all about. But go ahead. He said, you got to do all these things. For what? Verse 8. For these things be in you and abound. If they increase, they make you what? They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Uh -huh. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the wrath of brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Why? If ye do these things, ye shall never fit. Uh huh. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I say, look here. You want to make sure that you're not serving the Lord in vain. And you are in control of your salvation, you are in control of your deliverance. He said, wherefore the rather, brother, you give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You can know within your own mind, your own heart, what it is, if you're doing what it is that God is requiring you to do. And if you know that you are doing that, then you can rest assured. Yeah, I'm going to get into God's kingdom. That's not a problem for you. You're not going to, that's not going to be a problem when the Lord makes his second coming. You're not going to be a concern. You're not going to worry, talking about, oh, I should have, am, am, am I ready? You prepare yourself now. Now is the time for the preparation of your salvation, not when the Lord comes. Then the story is all over. At that point, all that has been done has been done. He said, Wherefore, the rather, brother, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. He said, For so an interest shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go ahead. 12. Wherefore, I will not ne ne be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, so though you know them. Go ahead. And be established in the present truth. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Peter said, look, I'm not going to be, he said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. To always remind you of these things, even though you are all fully aware of them. 
You've heard of him. You've read about him. You've heard me read about it. You've heard me preach about it. He said, but it does not matter. He said, yeah, I think it's good as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by putting you in remembrance always. Because the bottom line is this. What it's all about is getting into God's kingdom. And what's going to get you into God's kingdom is your obedience to his commandments. And you got to obey all of his commandments. Not just those that pertain to his service and worship, but the commandments that pertain to your treatment of one another. You got to live this life according to God's complete will. Not just those things that you like or those things that's easy to do. All of it. It's not always easy to forgive someone. It's not always easy to be merciful or kind or compassionate with those other things that we are required to do. Because again, if we want to become God, he's telling us we got to live our life as God now. When he says as, when I'm saying as God, the attributes that God has, we're supposed to be trying to acquire those same attributes. Turn over. The Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Because Peter told us we should give all due diligence to add these things into our say. We want to take the opportunity while we have the chance, because tomorrow's not always promised to us. Hebrews 5. They say you want to grow in grace. You want to grow in the word. Again, while you have a chance. And we don't want to be like these here that Paul Lord, is addressing. 5 and verse number 12. You go ahead when you get there. 5 and 12. For, for when for the time you ought to be teaching. You say, because by this time, he said, you ought to be teachers. Go ahead. Yeah, me that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. He say, you should be teaching. He said, by this time, he said, you ought to be teachers. You should know enough. He said, but you have need that one teach you again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and to become what? Now become such as have need of milk, uh -huh. and not a strong meat. Go ahead. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Uh huh. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. He said, "Look, by the time that you ought to be teachers, you are in need that one teach you again, which should be the first principles of the oracles of God, and to become such as." have need of milk and not of strong meat. Because you're supposed to progress. Like a baby, he's giving you an analogy. As a, as a baby goes from milk to what? Then they consume solid food. He said, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is as a baby. He said, for strong meat belongs to them that are a full age, that are mature. And he said, you should be at a point where you can have a partake of the strong meat, but you still want to partake of the milk. He said, even those who by reason of use or practice have their senses conditioned to discern both good and evil. You should know the difference. And not only knowing the difference, you should have the wisdom to exercise the knowledge that you gain. You should have the wisdom to do that which is right. Because what you do it's going to determine where you're going to spend all of eternity. First, let me go right into the sixth chapter. Six and one, and go ahead. Because Paul's letting us know we should be striving for spiritual growth. Go ahead. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Talking so about the elementary teaching. He said, therefore, moving forward, leaving those, let us what? Let us go on unto perfection. Go ahead. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. And of faith toward God. Paul said, look, therefore, leave in the elementary teaching the doctrine of Christ. He said, let us go on unto perfection. You want to grow in his word. He said, not land again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward Christ. 
You can't keep doing wrong over and over and over again and calling it mis a mistake because that's not a mistake. To do something repeatedly is not a mistake. That's an intention that's being mislabeled as a mistake. But God clearly knows the difference because he knows the intent of one's heart. He said, you don't want to do that. The laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward, towards Christ. Go ahead. On the doctrine of baptisms uh -huh. and of laying on of hands. Go ahead. And of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this what? And this will we do, if God permit. Go ahead. But it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good work of God and the powers of the world to come. That what is impossible for them to do what? And they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. See, it's one thing. I understand, too much is given, much is required. The more you know, the more God is required of you. <laughs> and to know what to do and not to do it is worse. They're not doing something because you were in ignorance. We know what does say the Lord. We could talk about all the people that's worshiping on Sunday and don't have a clue what's going on. That does not matter in the eyes of God. What matters is, as I always said, I don't see no well where the Lord is grading on the curve. He is going to reward those Again, that don't, that not talk about what's right. He's going to reward those that do what's right. Our knowledge in and of itself is not enough. We have to put that knowledge into practice. We have to grow and develop, mature our minds to the point that we can live according to the complete will of God. That's knowing how to treat one another. That's doing right by others, even when it goes against your very nature, even when it goes against your very being. You may not want to do it, but you know that's the right thing to do. That takes growth. That takes development. But if you never give it thought, you think that all I got to do, again, is attend the Holy Convocation, everything's going to be all right. We're supposed to attend the Holy Convocation because God commanded us to, to have one on his Sabbath day. You can know God. Look, our forefathers was right there with God. And none over the age of 20 got into the promised land. What should that tell us? God ain't playing. To know him is not enough. You gotta obey him. But go ahead. Middle six. Saying they crucified to themselves the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Turn over to 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. Again, as I said, we can all falter. We can all make a mistake. We can all slip. But doing the same thing over and over and over again is not a mistake. That's intention that's being called a mistake. 2 Corinthians. Because Paul is warning us here why we have the opportunity to serve the Lord, to take advantage of that opportunity. Because again, tomorrow's not promised to anyone. 6 and verse number 1. You go ahead when you get there. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he said, I have heard thee in a time of accepting. Go ahead. And in the day of salvation have secured thee. Uh -huh. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is what? Behold, now is the day of salvation. He said, look here, I'm begging you that you will receive this favor, this unmerited favor in vain. Don't take God's grace in vain. He said, for he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in a day of salvation have I secured thee. 
uh, help thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You serve the Lord while you have the opportunity to do so. You do all that you can to ensure, as Peter said, your entrance into God's kingdom. Go right into the seventh chapter, 2 Corinthians 7 and 1. Go here. What does Paul say? Because having received the promise of salvation, Paul is going to tell us what it is that we should do. Go ahead. Having therefore these promises, uh -huh. dearly beloved, what? let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Doing what? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He said, and having therefore these promises. Because God has promised just as the Father raised him from the dead, he's going to raise us from the dead. All that are obedient to him. He said, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He told us to be holy, for I am holy. He told us to be perfect. Being holy, what constitutes you being holy is being obedient. God's commandments. That's what makes you righteous in the eyes of God. That's what makes you holy. Being perfect is being able to live a godly life. Living this life according to the complete will of God. You have to develop a mindset. Mature. Grow in this word to the point you can do all that God is asking you to do. And it is possible Abraham showed us that. It is possible. Job showed us that. God is not telling us to do something that cannot be done. But Paul is saying, look, because of the promises that we have, he said, then you're going to do in accordance to your belief. Because you truly do believe, then you're going to stop doing contrary to the word of God. You're going to perfect holiness in your fear of the Lord. But turn over to Revelation the third chapter. We're almost done. Revelation 3 and verse number 1. Jesus is telling us the same thing here. 3 and 1. Tomorrow's not promised to us. And while we have the opportunity, we have to do what we're supposed to do. 3 and pick it up at verse Number one. Three and one. You go ahead when you get there. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis right. What? These things said he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Go ahead. I know thy works. Uh-huh. That thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. He said, unto the angel of the church in Sardis, you write these things. Said he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars of the seven angels. He said, I know your works. You have a name that thou livest. He said, but you're dying. Therefore, what? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Uh -huh. That are ready to die. Why? For I have not found thy works perfect before God. He said, you be watchful and you strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. He said, for I have not found your works complete before God. Therefore, what? Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. Uh -huh. Hold fast and repent. He said, you remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and you hold fast, he said, and you repent, you change. Go ahead. If therefore thou shalt not walk. What's going to happen? I will come on thee as a thief. Go ahead. Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon. Because our time is always. He said, therefore, you... He said, therefore, he said, if therefore thou shalt not watch, he said, I'm going to come on thee as a thief by the time when you least expect it. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Turn to Philippians, the third chapter. Because if we truly do believe in the message, if we really or truly do believe in the gospel, now is the time to prepare yourself to stand before the Lord. Three, and pick it up at verse number 11. But Paul here is going to reiterate what our focus in this life should be. If our goal is to be perfect like Christ, if our goal is to receive God's ultimate reward, his deliverance, his salvation, his perfection, three and left. Go ahead. Because Paul is telling you what he's looking for. 
Go ahead. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul said, look, if by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. If I might arrive at that, if I may lay on, lay hold of that. Go ahead. Not as though I had already attained. Go ahead. I'm the world already perfect. He said, not as if I already had it or I've been perfected. Not as if I received the ultimate goal. He said, if by any means I might obtain it to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already obtained, either were already perfect, but I was. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Go ahead. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Go ahead. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul understood something. He understood nobody said. Nobody. What he understood is that he is still seeking deliverance. He said, look, I count not myself to app apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth and to those things which are before. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what his focus in life was. To receive the promise that God had made, not just to Paul, but to everybody. And that is eternal life. That's what your, this life is about. It is preparation for the life come. And Paul said, I'm pressing toward that mark for the pride of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, go ahead. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. He said, let us therefore as many be perfect, be what? Be thus minded. Be mature and what? And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God will what? God shall reveal even this unto you. He said, let us therefore as many be perfect. He said, be thus minded or be mature, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it even this unto you. Anything that you are lacking, if you ask the Lord, he give it to you. He'll show you what it is that you need to do. But you have to desire it. You've got to want to serve. God gave man free will. We are free agents. He's not going to force you to do nothing. He's going to tell you what it is you should and should not do and leave it up to you. But you're going to determine your own faith. Drop down to verse number 20. Go ahead, this is it. My well, conversation is in heaven. You're talking about our way of life, not that anybody should be looking. You ain't looking to go to heaven. What you're looking for, he's going to tell you, is what? From whence also we look for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's looking for to come from heaven. He's looking for the return of Jesus. He said, and our manner of living should reflect what it is that we truly believe in. If I truly do be believe that God is coming back, that he's going to set up a kingdom here on this earth, then my whole purpose in life is what I need to do or be about doing what I need to do in order to get into that kingdom. He said, for our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's going to do what? Who shall change our vile body. Get that rid of this, rid us of this corruptible body, that it may be what? That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Go ahead. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Because we want to do the things now that will ensure us that we receive God's ultimate reward, that we're perfected in the end. We want to live our lives in according to God's complete will. We want to be holy and perfect now so that we can be made holy and perfect later. And that you must strive to be holy and perfect to ensure that you obtain perfection. I want to thank you for your time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the same as in the beginning with God. And the word was God. In the beginning was the same as in the beginning with God. And the word was God. In the beginning was the same as in the beginning with God. And the word was God. In the beginning was the same as in the beginning with God.